Welcome to Dugout Therapy, a baseball podcast about the mental game built by Coach Grace. If you're looking to succeed both on and off the field, this is the place for you. Welcome, guys. This is Dugout Therapy. I'm your host, Dave Wodzis, and I'm joined by my co-host, Quinn Adams. Quinn, how you doing, bud? Yes, sir. I'm doing fine. A little chilly down here in Coach Crates HQ. It's like an igloo, but I'm a little I'm bit powering through it. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. It's uh, it's pretty cold down here. We're bundled up. We got hoodies. We got fleeces on. I don't know why, um, but my office is pretty cold here at, at, at Coach Crates. So, but we're powering through. We had some uh, some coffee. And now we're ready to go. Cold uh, brew. Cold brew. Exact. Cold brew. Big Nitro. fan of cold brew. Um, black. I don't want any of that uh, added added bad stuff for you. But Correct. Um, just finished up recording a great episode, guys, with um, hitting consultant. Um, baseball mentality guru, you could say, yeah. Kevin Wilson. Um, Kevin's been a great mentor to me and, and as well as to many players and coaches out there and had some really great stuff regarding really writing writing a, a journey as, as a player and kind of discovering on your own, you know, what kind of hitter you are. And so there's a lot of great material. Um, Quinn, I, I mean, what do you think? It was great. Well, you knew him going into this, but mm-hmm. I didn't. So I was expecting, you know, when you hear hitting guru, like a hitting consultant, I was expecting a guy who was very set in his ways and wanted to switch up your swing or batting stance. And when in reality, it seems like he just wants to get to the root of whatever problem you're having hitting through your mentality, your mindset when you're stepping up at the box. So he's he's stressing the importance of this podcast, you know, mm-hmm. the fact that mentality plays a huge part in baseball. Yeah. Just like dugout therapy where we're, we're preaching the same message. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um being a mentor first, I think is a big part of his message. Um and you know, that's why I want to shed some light, you know, with this podcast to the mental game and and it was great to have him on. Um, so coaches, uh, get your pens and paper out. There's a lot of good takeaways, a lot of stuff that you can bring to your practices, to your games, to your you know post game talks, um, to your off season training. There's a lot of stuff. So um, tune in. Well, um, Kev, I'm, I've definitely been excited uh, for this one. Um, you know, being that. I think you've kind of followed me from the beginning of Coach Crates here and uh, chatted with you on and off about the business and about baseball. So I've been kind of dying, I think, to have a, a little bit more in-depth conversation with you. Um, so hopefully this is a time where we can dig in and, and talk a little bit about hitting and, and mentality. Um, you know, I talked with uh, Kevin Moisen a little bit about some stuff and, um, you know, can relate to a lot that you're doing with your business. So this is going to be exciting. Uh, I'm just really, really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. And absolutely, man, it's, I feel like we have a lot of similarities and uh, we're going through a lot of similar things, but also with the same purpose. For sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think either of us would be doing this without um, that purpose or that mission. Uh, You know, for us, it's, it's been to give back to coaches try to help them ultimately uh, impact their players in a positive way. So um, I think that will be kind of my focus uh, while chatting with you here. How, how could we help coaches ultimately help players? And um, you're, you know, on the forefront of that, helping players get better um, in the cage every day. So, Yeah, I, I think that what what we do um, on a daily basis, if we try to lift people up, we try to uh, inspire them, impact and influence them. I think in any walk of life or whatever we're trying to do, I think that's always a good place to start. So, you know, whether it's in the cage or we're, we're helping a coach, uh, mentor a young person uh, or, or we're, you know, helping someone cross the street. I think either way, um, you know, I always like to say all it takes is five minutes to change somebody's life. So. Um, and there's a lot of five minutes in a day. Uh, we're just trying to pick out some five minutes to help some people. And, and hopefully today we'll, we'll be able to do that. 
for sure. Yeah, I, uh, I love that quote. Um, yeah, so I, I guess where we can begin is um, if you can kind of fill in our guests on, you know, your background and, and your baseball story and, and we'll go from there. Sure. I'm a, um, uh, my title is I'm a professional hitting consultant. I work with major league and minor league players uh, behind the scenes. I like to say I work in the shadows <laughs> um, because it's not about me. It's about them and their career. I'm just blessed to be able to help, uh, have an opportunity to help them. Uh, to be a, a world-class listener for them, be a mentor, a friend, uh, a swing coach, a hitting coach, uh, uh, you name it. Uh, any given day, I could be uh, one of those or, or a couple of those. So that's my main job, uh, what I get to do. Like I said, I'm so blessed, but also I work with colleges and high schools, travel around the country and with my KWB experiences and, and be able to um, work with the coaches and the players in a two-day format and be able to really um, get to know them, uh, listen to their needs, what they need, and really try to help them, uh, not only with hitting, uh, but I always like to sprinkle in life um, and just try to be a mentor as well uh, as a hitting coach. But um, I started KWB in 2001. Um, I played professional baseball uh, six years, and uh, when I retired, I, I said I, I wanted to coach. Now, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be in the minor leagues and try to get to the big leagues. I never got there as a player. Mm-hmm. So I said, oh, I want to try to get there as a coach. And it wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but um, sometimes you have plans and God laughs in your face. So <laughs> what uh, I did not get uh, any minor league hitting coach jobs when I applied, I reached out to all 30 teams. And in fact, sitting here in my office, I have the air quotes rejection letters uh, from all 30 teams saying that uh, for one reason or another that uh, uh, they were not going to uh, grant me my wish of uh, being a hitting coach at that moment. But it was a blessing in disguise really because um, I started to coach in the Cape Cod League and uh, right when I got done playing pro ball and, and uh, I really liked that. I never got there as a player. I wasn't good enough. Um, so it was really cool to go back as a coach uh, a few years later and be able to um, kind of soak it in and see what all that experience was, uh, were about. So that was a, a tremendous uh, blessing to coach there in Ketuit, uh under Mike Roberts, a uh, legendary coach uh, up there. In fact, I think they just won the championship again mm-hmm. uh, here in 2019. But that was a fun time at Ketuit, small town. It was awesome. People were great. Um, and, and from there, I started coaching independent baseball because I still was getting uh, turned down. Uh, for these jobs. So I decided to kind of um, carve out my own resume, so to speak, and do independent baseball as a hitting coach. And um, I loved it. I really did. It, it taught me a lot. I, I basically taught at a uh, single A, double A, and triple A level. If you want to um, look at the independent leagues, uh, Frontier League, the k and League, and the Atlantic League. Uh, so I basically uh, went all the way through the minor leagues in my own way, so to speak, in independent ball. And I learned a ton. And I uh, learned how to manage people, learned how to manage a season, personalities, work with ownership, uh, the inner workings of baseball, the business of it. Uh, so for me, uh, it was it was uh, priceless, the education I was getting. Hopefully, I was able to impact uh, a few guys along the way. Certainly, they impacted me. Um, and then while I was going through that process, I said, man, I, I want to stay at home more. Uh, we had uh, our son at that time. And um, when I was thinking about this, I said, I just want to consult. I want to work with big league guys because when I got done playing, uh, I didn't. I didn't find a hitting coach that could do a couple of things for me. One, uh, I didn't. I wanted them to uh, a hitting coach to be able to talk mechanics and approach with me, which they did. Uh, but I also, at the same time, wanted someone to be able I could talk to uh, about life, uh, what was going on off the field, almost like that mentor piece. And I wasn't able to find that when I played. I'm not saying it wasn't around. Uh, I just hadn't heard about it and hadn't seen it with my own eyes. So. I wanted to be that guy. So I was doing that in the independent leagues. I said, man, I want to do that to the major league and minor league guys and be able to stay home. So I said, I want to do some consulting. And at the time, there weren't guys that were uh, hiring private guys the way that I wanted to do it. Certainly there were swing coaches out there and they still are today. Um, But the way that I wanted to do it is basically, you know, for example, take a walk with them around the city, talk to them about life and, and their family and really just listen uh, let, let them do all the talking. And, um, and so that's what I started to kind of, uh, do it, um, and, and head in that direction, I should say. Um, all the while I've been, I was coaching at a baseball academy 
and I was doing lessons in the off season and I was honing my craft there. And, and that was another priceless um, experience to be able to work with an eight year old all the way to a college guy and everybody in between all the different personalities and ways of doing things really would really allow me to sharpen my tool. So uh, I guess that's kind of bring me up to speed to where I'm at today, um, being able to uh, help those guys in pro ball and, and also help out colleges and high schools. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, from kind of hearing that uh, front end there, I think the powerful part of that is, you know, throughout everything, you kind of had to write your own journey. There wasn't anything kind of handed to you and you kind of had to do it yourself. And I feel like I'm kind of going through the beginning of that now, which is, is kind of cool uh, to relate to some pieces in there. Um, and then obviously on the coaching side of things, you know, coaching young players up to uh, older players, there's a lot of different things you face in there. Um, but yeah, that that's, that's really cool. Um, so yeah, I, I guess me and Quinn had some, um, some cool mentality questions we wanted to kind of run by you, whether it be about, um, your book, good batting or, um, just kind of some stuff that we've talked about in the past or, um, have, have come across. So, um, maybe we can start with um, your book a little bit. What were some big, you know, themes, I guess, in good batting that you like to, to bring into your lessons? Yeah. I mean, the, the good batting book um, and, and both books, Finding Clarity it was, is the other one, are both very short books. As you know, they're small, short books, easy to read. Um, it's a, a book you can dip in and dip out um, uh, because number one, baseball players don't like to read. Uh, number two, um, I know they weren't going to read with that being said, I know they were not going to read a 300 page book. Uh, neither would I. Um, and, and, and the, the, the gist of the book, um, I guess the purpose of the book is I saw so many guys just drowning in information. Uh, I like to say the hitters are drowning in information, but starving for wisdom. And, uh, the wisdom piece of it is just to simplify things. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're getting overloaded with information, which, uh, hitters are today, they're looking for that clarity. They're looking for something that's pretty simple that applies to them. And, and when I wrote the good batting book, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to teach you anything. I really didn't. Uh, what I wanted to do was share a couple stories, uh, highlight a few things. And, uh, you know, I wanted you to learn by you thinking through, uh, what you did, how you did it, and most importantly, why you did it. Mm -hmm. And um, in the good batting book, you know, there's examples of being able to stay focused. Um, you know, if you take six swings and only, you know, three, you're focused for three of them. Uh, and then the next three, you just kind of, you know, you, you check out. Um, I gave a couple of examples of minor leaguers who did that. So you don't have to be 12 to do that. You could be 21 and a bonus baby and, and experience <laughs> the same thing. And so I tried to give, again, a couple examples in there to be able to say, hey, listen, you know, have a purpose for everything that you do, understand why you do what you do, and have a plan, whether it's a two-strike approach, what is that? Um, or just even have one, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or just think through and say, hey, what is your view from the batter's box? Do you understand that the pitcher has 17 inches to throw to? And you have a couple acres as a hitter, a fair territory to hit a ball into and things like that. So I try to paint a picture. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, I try to lead them along a line so that they can think about what they do in order to learn. That's awesome. Yeah. I think, you know, that perspective too, is something probably not being actively given, at least from the coaches I had coming up, um, you know, recently because, you know, a lot of coaches want it done one way, want this done one way or, or that way. And I think guiding a hitter to, to figure out who they are as a hitter is so much more important and something that like I didn't really get into until the back end of my college career, trying to actually figure out what type of hitter I am and thinking about um, what type of mental approach I want in certain situations and stuff. And um, I had to kind of find out, I think that journey on my own, I had a few coaches that guided me towards that but a lot of them that I've uh you know played for wanted it done one way or the other and I I, I think it doesn't work for a majority I think it works for a, min a minority I, I 
Couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I was a switch hitter when I played, so I had two different swings and two different personalities. And and basically I was bipolar in a baseball sense. Um, so with that being said, I knew that not everybody was the same. And and the beauty for me and, and a lot of coaches that are like this mm -hmm. that I've been around is the the curiosity you have when you first meet somebody. Uh, I want to know how they tick. I want to know where they've come from. I want to know their background. I want to know mom, dad, grandma, who taught you? What was your coach's philosophy in college or high school or literally depending on where, you know, who they are, where they're at. What's the philosophy of the high school that I'm working with here? What do you guys believe in? Because I, I don't, I don't want to start from square one. And I think that a, a, those types of coaches you're talking about the one way uh, or my way or the highway is they start at step one and they go to step 20. And they just do each step over and over, not taking into account, like you said, the personality of the player, where they are at, the skill set, the mindset, et cetera. Uh, for me, I want to meet them where they're at in their life, in their career, in their swing, you name it. And then I'll build out from there. So uh, what I love is every uh, every player that I, I get to meet is a blank canvas. And I try to ask really good questions and I try to be a world-class listener so that they teach me how they want to be taught. And if I'm a good observer, I can see how their body moves, how their swing is. And I can use that information along with what they told me and a little bit of research of what I've done as well. Uh, and I put it all together, almost like in a blender and try to mix it all together. And it comes out a drink that they want, not so much the drink that I like. And, and so I couldn't agree with you any more on that about individualizing, customizing an approach and a swing uh, to that player uh, individually. That's awesome. Yeah. Love that. Kind of reflecting on that, you know, say, um, you know, some coaches are going to be listening to this, you know, what, what would you say has been a good like mental team approach Um you know, that you've talked about maybe in your, those team lessons or those, those two days um, with the KWB experience that, you know, ha has really maybe stuck or made sense to the team as a good mental approach um, offensively. I think kind of going back when I do the experiences, I customize it to every okay. um, school program. Awesome. But um, to answer your, your question, I think what comes out of it in all of them, and however we get there, we get there. It get, we can get there a bunch of different ways. Is that uh, as a hitter, it's really understanding how to hit. And a piece of that, and, and I think a big example that's that's current uh, all over, from the big leagues all the way down to the teams that uh, I work with, with the experiences, is that you need to know, number one, what type of pitch you hit the best. And for 99.99% of good players, it's going to be the fastball. And so the easiest pitch to hit is a fastball. Um, the easiest pitch to throw for a pitcher is a fastball. So you kind of lead off with that and say, listen, the, the, easy, the best pitch that he's got to throw a strike so he's not walking the yard is a fastball. Easiest pitch for you to hit is a fastball. So let's start there. His strength is actually your strength. Um, and something that you practice all the time. Very, very few young people practice breaking balls or change-ups that they hit off. They, they hit off of front toss or chair BP or batting practice or machine, and it's all fastball, fastball, which I think is good. You need to, you, if you're going to be a good hitter, you need to square up a good fastball because if you can't, you, you'll have no shot at the next level, as you know. So, um, you know, with that being said is understanding what pitch you hit the best fastball. Now, the second thing is understanding where on the plate that is. Um, and I like to do a seven ball drill where I'll put seven balls down in front of the home plate. One ball being on the inside corner, the four ball is going to be center cut and the seven ball is going to be on the outside mm -hmm. corner. And I'm going to throw them a bunch of balls and I want them every time they make contact, I want them to tell me over which baseball they make contact. So if I throw it down the middle and it's a four ball and he swings, he'll, after he hits the ball, I don't care where it goes. After he hits the ball, he's going to have to tell me, He's going to yell out, uh, hopefully, a four. He'll say four. And if he says a two, then I'll correct him. and say, no, that was a four. Uh, and they learn the strike zone, not their strike zone yet. They'll start to learn the strike zone, depending on where they stand, depending on where their swing or how their swing is and how it covers the plate, good or bad. 
And then after that, after doing that for, you know, 10 or 15 pitches, I'll, I'll ask them and say, Hey, okay. Over what four baseballs over the, uh, of that seven. So over what four baseballs does your swing play the most natural where you drive that ball most naturally. And then they'll, they'll pick out the four and I'll be there to be able to tell them like, yeah, I agree with that hundred percent or eh, this is what I'd see. What do you think? And it might be a ball off or so. It's never more than that. In my experience, they're usually pretty honest mm-hmm. with themselves. Um, and this is the whole point of, Hey, you know, getting them to, to think in order to learn. Um, so from then on out, the rest of the experience, I say, you can only hit out of this with less than two strikes. You can only hit out of this tunnel because we want to master your strengths. So as an example of, um, on any team, whether it was, you know, independent baseball or working with the, the pro, you know, major league guys, minor league guys, um, you know, it's, it's mastering your strengths, being aggressive in your zone. Um, and if you practice hitting your pitch in your zone a lot, then it'll be less likely that you miss it in the game. And it's kind of the old adage, like how do you hit the breaking ball? Don't miss the fastball, <laughs> yeah. you know, or, or if you're, you're sitting there and, and you're chasing everything under the sun and you're always Oh two, well, how do you stay away from a lot of two strike counts? Yeah. Don't miss that pitch in your zone early in the count. And so, um, you know, you don't like that, that, that bastard slider when it's Oh two, well, don't miss the fastball in your zone when it's OO or one Oh. So, uh, things like that to be able to help them master what they do really, really well. We can't perfect anything in baseball, obviously round ball, round bat just doesn't work that way. So what we're trying to do is trying to, to help them gain confidence through their preparation. If they prepare with a better mindset, a better purpose, understand why in this case, you know, being on time for that fastball in their zone or be on time for a pitch in their, their happy zone in that tunnel, then their preparation breeds their confidence mm-hmm. during the game. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, a phrase I always kept in the back of my mind, prior preparation prevents piss poor for performance. And uh, if I, if I always stuck to that, that seemed to help me. <laughs> Yeah, it really, it really, um, it, it, and listen, I did the same thing when I was younger, when I was playing. Um, so and that's the other thing I always, I always try my best to remember how hard hitting is, even though I say hitting is simple, it's just not that easy. And I still hold, you know, I still, um, you know, believe in that a thousand percent, but I think in other in terms of coaches you were talking about earlier, something that we can never forget as coaches is how hard this game really is at times. Um, at times it could seem simple when we're in that zone, right? Things just happen. Um, but I, I had a lot of down uh, moments in my career. I also had a lot of uh, great moments in my career. And I think anybody could detest to that in their own oh, yeah. career. So um, I try not to forget how hard this is, but at the same time I want their confidence at, at all time high or as high as it can be in that particular day or season of their life. Um, so I want to make sure their prep work. Um, they don't skimp on that. The guys that I work with, they know that, um, I'm very meticulous in their preparation. Um, even if they put the ball on the tee wrong, uh, or they just kind of take a pitch off or whatever, then I'll say something. I never raise my voice. Um, you know, what you're hearing right now is kind of, you know, the speed I operate at all the time. So, uh, you know, I, I say, I always tell the guys, say, listen, if you see me panic, you're in trouble because I've never panicked before as a hitting coach, you know? So I panicked as a player numerous times, but not as a coach, because I'm just, you know, I, I understand more and, and have a vision better now. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's the thing. If, if we help them prepare and we're very meticulous, what we do, you don't have to take a thousand swings. You can take 10 swings and be just as good as taking 50. If you have a purpose to what you're doing, uh, and then go off and do something else with your life. So you have a good work-life balance or alignment, as they say. Um, but yeah, so I want to double down on that prep and make coaches out there, make sure that your guys are doing the proper prep work for them. If a guy needs to stand on top of his head to get ready, let him do that. If he needs to go you know, drink five cups of water before going, let him do that. Uh, embrace who they are. Um, they better give you a reason why they're doing that. And if they do, and it's a good reason, you know, then let them go. Cause now you're allowing them to embrace themselves. And that goes down a whole nother rabbit hole of the mental approach. So you've coached in all levels of competition, it seems, especially with hitting, 
what is the biggest progression or uh, uh i don't know what you call them clients that that you've been most proud of you know you, you've seen the biggest improvement who quinn never asked, been asked that had. question before it's a good one that's why i get paid the big bucks quinn i like it i i think it's tough to pinpoint one it really is because the way that I look at my job and what I'm here to do, like I mentioned at the beginning, is 10% of what I do is hitting and 90% is the mentor piece. Mm. Um, there there are a couple similar things that have, have stood out to me over the last however many years now, 10 years or so, that um, – they have everything that none of this stuff happened in a cage. Um, it happened away from the field where I like to take guys away from the toxic environment. That's called professional baseball. Uh, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of, uh, things that happen there that most fans don't know about. Um, it, it could be toxic at times and you feel like you're in your own little bubble. Cause you, you know, you're playing every day and you don't even know what's going on in the real world. You, you you sleep in till noon and you get up and you go to the ballpark and you, you're in that little cocoon and then you go back to the hotel or back to your house or on a, on a charter and you're just mm -hmm. doing that for seven months and it, and it gets, it gets, it can get toxic at times. So the things that stand out to me and what I'm most proud of guys, not necessarily for hitting 300 or getting to the big leagues or making their first all-star game or signing their big first big contract to me are the times when they're, at their lowest where I've been there myself. I think we all have had times in our lives where we just don't feel uh, the best about ourselves and it could be at any level. Um, but I'm most proud of those guys where they are vulnerable enough to trust me with the things that they, they, they tell me. And I, I am so grateful for the opportunity and that trust, be able to be again, a world-class listener and to be able to listen intently to what their needs are in that moment, it could be a, a, a dispute with their wife or parents or girlfriend or whatever the case may be, or something that, that's come up from their childhood that they're still dealing with. I mean, I am not a licensed physician or a, a life coach in, in terms of that. If it ever got to that point, like in the past, I've, I've suggested people that are licensed for that. But for me, most of the stuff that does go on, uh, I'm able to handle just because I've been in that arena and I've been in, in, in that locker stall and I've been there where you look down and you're like, I don't even know if I belong here. This is all I know. This is my identity. Uh, I'm known as a baseball player. Uh, I don't even want to be a baseball player anymore. I envy my friends who went you know, out of college and they got a real job, so to speak. And they're working nine to five. And, and now in today's world, I see them post about they're doing this and that. And I'm over here. I'm hating life. So I, I guess I guess those are my most proud moments of the guys that can work through that, pick themselves up and get themselves back on track. And the public has no idea any of that stuff happens. So I guess if you could pick one thing, a, a common theme is I'm most proud of the guys when they do that, because if you're not living life right off the field, you ain't going to live life right on the field. And, and so, cause you, people are like, Oh, you know, it's just a game. You know, you're playing a kid's game. Yeah. You're playing a game, but when you get in the pro ball, it's business, it's cutthroat. If you don't perform, you're out. Yeah. And, and so it's very, <laughs> it's very hard to find any other job like that. Um, in an environment where you kind of have to do a lot of it on your own and you have to have a very tight inner circle. So that inner circle, again, for the players I work with, I'm so grateful to be a part of that because I know that it's a very tough door to get in. I'm certainly not banging on the door trying to get in. They welcome mm -hmm. me in and I'm, I'm so grateful and I take that very seriously. So I'm almost proud of the guys for that. I mean, it's it, they get a hit and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's that's icing on the cake. But I know like, when I watch um, for guys that go through stuff like that, it's even more satisfying, not because they got the hit or they hit the homer or they're back playing well. It's because yeah, of, I, think I know that's their so struggle powerful. and I know their um, walk. 
you, you know, you're saying 90% of the time you're, you're spending probably off the field thinking about or working on things that affect that on-field performance. And probably, you know, most times these players are looking for that mentor in, instead of a coach and, and you got to provide that for them to, to get over those hurdles. Um, so I think that definitely is so powerful um, for players. Yeah. Like I, 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 like I said in the beginning, I, I just, I was looking for that as a player. I was looking for a one minute swing coach next minute, talk about approach, how to face this guy. And then the third thing is, man, I just want to, just want to get some things off my chest. So uh, again, if I can continue to provide that for guys, I'm not for everybody. Not everybody's looking for that, and that's fine. Um, you know, I, I I can't service everybody, but I know that um, I've been put in in places where it has worked in terms of uh, guys looking for somebody like myself, and and that's why I try to every day strive to get better in order to better serve them. Certainly, talk about ten years ago, a little bit earlier, like I, I'm way better at it than 10 years ago. And hopefully 10 years from now, Mm -hmm. I am way better at than now. And it's just, you know, like my friend Joe Ferrero says on our podcast, you know, 1% better. Um, If I can get a little bit better, those guys teach me how to teach the next guy. Because if I'm just uh, listening, right, they'll teach me everything I need to know. It's definitely been one of our things um, on the Coach Crates team here. No matter like what we do in the business, if we can do it, 1% 1% better than yesterday, then we're getting somewhere. And that's kind of been our philosophy thus far. Um, and then relating to you on, on the player side of things, I was always looking for a mentor. And I had one guy in college that would provide it. I don't know if he was oh, always knew he was trying being a mentor and I was just coming to him rambling about my last three rounds or my last three games. But, um, uh, I would, I was one of those guys I'd hop out of the cage or <laughs> a- after an at bat and be like, you know, I don't know what the heck I was doing up there, but it felt like I was doing this or felt like I was doing that, or I was seeing this or I was seeing that. And a lot of the time I was told, you know, shut your brain off. And, I needed to do that sometimes, <laughs> but, um, yeah, that, that's the type of guy I was. And I was always looking for, for mentors on the field. It, it's funny. Cause I, I, I've had a few former teammates reach out to me over the last few years and, um, it's been great to catch up with them. Uh, but there, are a couple of them have told me stories where apparently I mentored them. Like you said, like I, I mentored <laughs> them, I helped them out of something. And I was like, you guys gotta be out of your mind. <laughs> I said, I, I was a mess. I said, I, I was trying to fight through my own forest. I said, I, I wasn't really, I don't think I was trying to help anybody, but they, they were telling me like it happened yesterday and I felt bad because I didn't remember it. And, you know, as I look back on it, I was like, wow, you know, I was, I was in a worse shape than I thought when I was playing mm-hmm. and, but I was still able to apparently help at least a couple guys and they remembered it. And so that's, that was my beginning of the five mm-hmm. minutes thing. You know, all it takes is five minutes to change somebody's life. And, and apparently I took some, I took five minutes with these guys, even though I don't, I don't remember any of it. And it's kind of sad in my mind. It's like, man, I didn't even remember an impact I made. And so, you know, today I don't ever want that to happen again. I, I want to, I can't remember everything. I'm not the smartest guy in the, in the, in the, in the book, in the shed, but mm-hmm. I, I just don't want that to happen again. And and it really fuels my fire every day is I want to be better. I want to be present. I want, I want to be plugged into people. Um, If, if I could help them when I didn't even think I was helping anybody, I was just trying to help myself. I I wonder what I can do when I'm actually focused and plugged in and and trying to serve others. And so it's funny you brought that up because it, it, it just, that that's something that really struck me. Yeah, I mean, how out of in touch the I was can, back when I was playing. You know, you can you can forget and you know be be caught up in it. I think sometimes, and uh, my my last two years of college as uh, a captain, I I feel like maybe I was almost focusing on uh, trying to help everyone so much that I ven- that I then had to take a step back and be like, what can I help you with or do who wants you know help or and then when i kind of took that approach to it 
um, like a lot of guys on our team would then just come to me to, to chat, to vent or, or whatever. Um, and that seemed to, to work well for our team. But what we're going to do now is we're, we're getting close to about a, a, the end of this. So we just want to do kind of a quick pitch uh, questions. We're going to call them some rapid fire ones to, to end here. And um, then we can wrap things up. But it's been fun thus far. Yeah, yeah this is let's on, go. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. This is an honor. What's your favorite baseball book? Book. Ooh, I would have to say Three Nights in August by Buzz Bissinger. If you guys haven't read it, I don't know what it, when it was uh, written, but it was, and I know I'm ruining your whole quick hitter thing here, um, but it's it's written about Tony, Tony La Russa. I mean, Three Nights in August, obviously about three days, but it goes through everything from, uh, Buzz does a great job as he always does when he writes, but he, he depicts kind of what Tony's going through from the time he wakes up to the time he goes to sleep, all the little things in the three days of all the things that were happening internally. Um, it's just fascinating how he was writing out the lineup card, how he did the lineup card, what he wrote on it, his, his strategies to this is fascinating. But that's that's my favorite. I'm cheating. I'm going to go Ken Burns documentary on baseball. Mm, I, re- I watched that as a kid really? uh, when he came out on PBS. Yeah. Yeah, I'm showing my age, but it, it was uh, – my dad taped it VHS. Hello, is the mic on? Anybody over 40 remembers that VHS tapes. <laughs> um, it, it, I think my dad still has it at his house. I think he has all like 12 cassette tapes. Problem is I don't have a VH, VHS player anymore, so I can't watch them. <laughs> right. It, it's it's amazing though, Dave, if you haven't seen it. it it's just about like the dead ball era and yeah, going all yeah. the way through. So what's one piece of advice you would give a player trying to advance to the next level that might be struggling, could be in a slump, uh, you know, second guessing their mechanics when they're up in the plate? Who we could go so many directions with it, but I'll try to, I'll try to land the plane with two. Uh, one, believe in yourself. Um, sometimes that's hard to do, but. I, I'm a firm believer. God gave us all strengths. He also gave us weaknesses, but believe in the strengths that you do have. Um, and they will never leave you, even though sometimes they feel like they're gone. Um, but naturally they're there and they'll come back. They'll come back and they will. Sometimes I never thought they'd come back, but they always did. Uh, the things I did really well, my strengths. And number two um, with that is, Stay in your lane with those strengths that you have. You're good, and that's enough. You don't have to be great. Everybody's like, oh, you know, strive for greatness and strive for perfection. I I don't plug into that philosophy because we all have our, our, again, our strengths, and they only go up so far for each of us. Uh, Mike Trout is Mike Trout. Uh, There's only one of him. Uh, if there were a couple more that we could get there, uh, don't you think that we would all try to get there? But I think that we all have to realize what we're uniquely gifted at doing, find that and double down on that. So if you're only 80% as good as somebody else, but you're really good at being 80%, that's good and you're good and that's enough. We don't need 81%. We don't need 90%. I was guilty of it as charged multiple times as a player trying to be better than I actually was. But when I was looking back to playing wiffle ball in the backyard, I wasn't trying to be better than anybody else on that wiffle ball field. I was just being me. And sometimes I hit bombs. Sometimes I missed the ball. Um, Sometimes I could make a curve like nobody's business. And sometimes it went straight. But at the end of the day, I always went home and I was just playing my game. And I was good, and that was enough for that day. Um, so our our last one, I, I wanted to ask it in the podcast a little bit earlier, but I'll, I'll end with it. Who is your coolest guest uh, you've had on KWB Radio thus far? Oh, man, it, it was over after episode one, Charlie Manuel. Wow. My guy, Chuck, he was number one. He's been a mentor. Uh, he's taught me so much. Still to this day, just listening to him. And 
Um, you know, just watching him, everything about Chuck, uh, he's like the coolest dude on earth, in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, at, we could have shut the uh, podcast down after, after episode one, no offense to my dear friend, David Eckstein, who was number two guest, uh, world yeah. series MVP in 2006 for the Cardinals. Um, he was number two, Joe, my, my host, uh, my, my co-host Joe Ferraro, he said, uh, do you have to be a world series champ to get on this podcast after the first two? <laughs> Uh, and if you'd only listened to two, you had to be, but, uh, yeah, Chuck definitely hands down, uh, still my favorite. Uh, I love all the guys. Um, it's, it's just like what you guys are doing. It's pretty unique when you get to sit down in an intimate setting like this and be able to ask the questions you want to ask. Um, so yeah, if you, if, if people haven't listened to it yet, uh, Charlie Manuel on a KWB radio podcast, episode numero uno. Um, wow. let me know what you guys think. Way to start off a podcast. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, I listened to an episode recently. I was going into it expecting to hear some baseball insight. And then I was listening. You guys were talking about, uh, incorporating peaches and sangria. And I like, I like that. Just jump around topic to topic, free flowing. And, uh, everybody should give that a listen. Thank you. Yeah. My uh, Joe, we wouldn't be able to do it without my best friend, Joe. And, um, I love to, to wind them up and let them go. Our intros, uh, can get a little lengthy at times, depending on, on what the topic is of that week. You listen to the sangria. Um, he, 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 he doesn't like it. His parents own a restaurant. He's a, he's a foodie. Uh, he could be over the top with it at times. I love him to death. It's what makes this, this show so good. Uh, so he and I go back and forth pretty well and, and it could get out Abbott and Costello sometimes. All right. Well, I mean, that wraps up our quick, uh, pitch questions and, uh, Kevin, thanks for being on with us. This was really awesome. I really enjoyed it. Thank you guys. I, like I said, I'm honored to be on the show. I, I, I know the podcast grind, um, as they say, but I don't think it is a grind. I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a love for what you guys are doing and what we do. Uh, we're just grateful enough uh, to be able to share um, on our platforms. I'm including you guys and, and I wish you guys all the best as you continue. And I'm just again, yeah, so grateful you. that um, I'll, I'll yeah, be able to be a small a part of it with I you mean, guys. If you guys want to check out more on Kevin, uh, kwbbaseball.com, um, anywhere else, um, Kev, you want people to check you out on? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you can check me out on Twitter at kwbaseball. That's on Instagram as well at KW Baseball. Like you said, kwbaseball.com is our website. KWB Radio is the podcast. It can be found anywhere podcasts are, are uh, put out there. And um, yeah, if you guys want to contact me, you know, fill out the contact sheet or DM me on Twitter or Instagram or any of those platforms, awesome. be happy to chat with you, discuss, answer any questions. Thanks, guys, for listening. Um, it was a really good episode there with Kevin Wilson. Um, so thankful that we got to get have him on here um, and let him kind of tell his story and, and give his uh, point of view on, on, on hitting and, and baseball mentality. Um, so if you guys enjoyed the episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. We'd love to get your feedback. If it's good or bad or indifferent, we'd, we'd love your feedback. We want to get 1% better on every single episode that we do um, so we can bring great content to you guys um, out there and, and keep helping more coaches and ultimately you know help, help players and help kids get better um, and, and love this game like we do. Um, so yeah, if you could, if you could leave a review on iTunes, that'd be great. Subscribe to us there at uh, Dugout Therapy. And um, in addition, check us out on www.coachcrates.com and check us out on Instagram and Facebook, both Coach Crates at Coach Crates um, and Twitter as well at Coach Crates. Um, shoot us a message, send us a post. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to interact. But thanks again, guys. It was fun.